Uh, hello, everybody. I am sharing my screen, so I can't um, see very much of how many is here, but I'll be, I'll stop sharing in a minute. My name is Kasia. I'm uh, one of, Kasia Brezhna, I'm one of the Foundation Year leads, uh, so I'm one of the people who manage the Foundation Year program. Uh, and I'll be here just to talk you briefly through the program, uh, through its aims, objectives, what's on offer, what are the benefits, um, and how does it work. And I'm have here with me uh, Jenny, who's one of our current students, who will be also sharing her experiences on, of the program with you. Jenny is actually in one of my classes. So Jenny, over to you to introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jenny and I'm in the Business Management, Economics and Law class. And yeah, I hope you all enjoy this talk and yeah. decided to come to SOAS next year. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks Jenny. So as I said, we'll just talk you through um, some of the key elements of the program, its benefits, um, and then at the end we will move to uh, our Q&A session. So like Laura said, you can pop your questions, I believe, in the, in the, in the, in the chat box, I believe. So some of you might have seen this on um, our website. We have two foundation year programs available at SOAS, apart from the international program. So, so this is sort of separate. And the foundation programs we offer, uh, the two pathways are social sciences, arts and humanities, and the other pathway is business management, economics and law. Um, the, in terms of the setup, the foundation year program at SOAS, or either one of those two, is set up in a form of an extended degree i.e. if a student would traditionally, let's say, enroll on a three-year program, if they uh, decide to do and enroll on the foundation program as well, that automatically extends the duration of their overall program into four years. For some degrees at SOAS, particularly the language courses, which normally are four years, the foundation year program would then make this a, a five-year program. And that's in terms of the registration. So it's uh, we see you straight away as a student um, of SOAS and uh, with the intention obviously to stay and to progress um, to one of the existing courses. Now in terms of the two pathways, I'm going to show you in a minute the, the modules that are covered on, on each one of the pathways. They are quite similar with uh, one of the core modules being the, the biggest difference between those two. Um, both programs are allow students to progress to any uh, degree available at SOAS. So for example, if there is a student who's considering uh, progressing into, I don't know, economics, we would obviously strongly encourage them and suggest that they actually follow or, or enroll on the business management, uh, economics and law pathway. However, uh, nothing is really stopping them to, let's say, uh, sign up to the social sciences pathway explore other options available and if at the end if they still wish to do economics that is absolutely not a problem oh, sorry i'm trying to move to the uh, next slide so who is the foundation program um, aimed at uh, we believe it's an you know excellent preparation for students who in some cases may be out of education may have been out of education for uh, for a while or would benefit from another year um, of study before actually starting the degree. Um, in some cases, that would be students who um, applied for direct entry, so applied for a particular um, degree at SOAS. However, they may have missed out on the tariff. Uh, if they then meet our tariff requirement, we would offer them foundation year program um, and see it as a bridge really between their previous education and, and, and joining a degree. <clears throat> we also have um, a number of students who are maybe worried about jumping straight into year one. They're not quite sure which degree they would like to progress to uh, or choose. And foundation year is that extra year which allows them to really explore what's available, the, the different options um, that they can pick from. Uh, and then to make a better and more, more informed decision. I would say that this is particularly important at SOAS. Uh, I'm sure as you've seen on our website and maybe on other open days, speaking to alums, speaking to fellow students, how many different degree choices are there available at SOAS? It's absolutely fantastic. Um, we offer very unique combinations. We're quite often the only place in the world that offers a specific combination, or definitely in the UK. And quite often those um, degree choices, those subjects, don't have a direct level equivalent. 
and students often don't know about them. So I would say that one of the key benefits of foundation is being that extra year uh, at school, being part of the cohort, being, um, you know, joining the society, speaking to other students, speaking to lecturers, um, allows students to really know what they would like to do uh, and then make an informed choice in terms of progression. Uh, we obviously have academics who support the, the students in making those choices, um, guide them. You can discuss um, your worries, queries, any questions you may have with the departments you're thinking of going to. So I would say that extra year is extremely beneficial. Not to mention everything students will learn on the program, sorry. So what does the curriculum look like? Um, you will see all the modules that we offer. So on the in the first column on the left hand side, you have the module name, which I'll, I'll talk briefly about credits without getting too technical here. These are academic credits that you know count towards your degree. And um, I've included in this slide because you can also see sort of how, how big, how heavy the modules are and, and how long they last. So you will see from the third column that some of our modules last only one term. So either term one or term two. Some of them are a little bit longer uh, and last a full year. Now, I'll start from um, the top. So uh, academic practice, this is our core module. I would say it's uh, probably the spine of the program. So it's the module which really uh, polishes the skills that our students come with and make sure that the students are, are fully ready for an undergraduate degree in terms of their academic skills. So in those classes, students practice things such as critical thinking, critical writing, analysis, presentation skills, and definitely a lot of research. Um, actually, a research project is, is a mini research project is um, part of that program. In addition to this module, in term one, students also have a digital skills and uh, technology module, which obviously again refreshes their, their digital uh, skills. We also have an employability element. Their students are asked to do um, really virtual kind of, maybe not a full CV, but an element of a CV. Um, very, very interesting module with a lot of positive feedback. I would say that one of our most popular modules is the World from SOAS module. So that's the third one on the list, also delivered in term one. And as you can imagine, this module focuses on um, key themes um, currently going on in the world and the SOAS view on them. And uh, I would say students really enjoy this. We get a lot of positive feedback about this module because it um, maybe highlights, shows, other points of view um, and students really enjoy it. I will now take you down, I'll skip the next two lines to the bottom two modules. You'll see the um, introduction modules. So introduction to social sciences, arts and humanities with a little asterisk and introduction to business management, economics and law with a little asterisk. That simply means that students would only do one of those modules depending on the pathway which they're on. So i.e. depending on the foundation um, program that they chose. Uh, so, for example, Jenny with us today, she's on the business management, economics and law module. So um, this module introduces those four disciplines throughout the year. So students will have a few weeks of business, few weeks of management, few weeks of economics, few weeks of law. As an example, right now, we've just started term two. We've just uh, finished our first week of term two. In term two, we move to the second part of this module, economics and law. And this is the time where we actually bring the economics department, we bring the law department who deliver the lectures for our students. Um, and that allows them to, to sort of see what they can expect if they choose to progress to those um, programs. Same goes for social sciences, of course. So in term one, we do more of a, I would say similar to history uh, class and, and current events as well. Uh, but we also in turn to bring lecturers from various other departments who, who share their research, what they're interested in, what their departments are about, what their programs are about. And again, allowing students to make that slightly more informed choice. Um, and now I'll come back to the middle of this table. So another, the last two term two modules are cultural fluency, uh, which is a nice natural uh, follow-up, follow-on from the world from SOAS module. 
And uh, my personal favorite numbers and quantitative reasoning. So this is not a maths module. I think I'll need to stress that. This is more um, of a module in how to work with numbers, how to present numbers, how to incorporate numbers and feel comfortable with them into, into individual research that our students will conduct later on. So that gives us the, the overview of the program. So these are all modules are compulsory again just bearing in mind the asterisk one at the bottom where students only do one of the two, depending on the pathway. Uh, in addition to that, obviously there's plenty of co-curricular activities uh, going on, but in terms of the actual timetabled um, classes, this is how the program looks like. So it is one year, and at the end of the year, uh, so the academic year, students let us know then what degree they like to progress to and, um, and we'll take it from them. In a minute, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how the progression works from foundation to, to year one. But moving, moving on with uh, just a few slides of my presentation. So what will the program allow you to achieve? Um, like I said, the, the skills element, I would say is, is the core of the program. So make sure, we make sure that students are ready to, to thrive and really do well in their undergraduate programs as they move on. As you can imagine with SOAS um, being quite a distinctive institution um, with you know, strong values at our core, we, we introduce students to this. I mean, a lot of them already know this, so we really engage with the students um, into those conversations and building a global university together. Um, in terms of providing students uh, with insight into the different academic disciplines, I touched on this a little bit at the beginning, um, and I can't highlight this point enough, especially with um, the huge choice that students have um, at SOAS. So this is, we're currently in our third year of delivery. I've been on the program since the very beginning. So I, I always have a look and sort of see how the trends are changing and uh, in terms of our students' choices. And one very interesting observation I just personally made is we ask students when they arrive, which degrees they're thinking about. This is in no way written in stone. We, we, we don't change their profiles. This is just to allow us to plan better, to know which departments to engage with, to extend particular invites to students, um, to, to make sure that we give them the best experience. And then at the end, I actually compare this to what's, what's the choice they actually made at the end of the course. And um, students sometimes uh, change their minds that, that that is the case, uh, where they originally came with a with a different idea, with a different plan. And, and at the end of the foundation program, they quite often come to see me and say, Miss, um, I, I've been, I don't know, attending the economics lectures, absolutely love it. I've changed my mind, I would like to do that. But another interesting thing is that a lot of students actually add a language to their original choice. Um, and that wasn't necessarily their idea when they were coming in, but having explored that throughout the year, they quite often go for, for, a, for a joint option. Um, I think this is also probably a good point to talk a little bit more about the progression and how does the foundation year blend into the, the whole four or five year degree, depending on, on the remainder of the course. So like I said, students um, who come into the program are, are automatically enrolled on a four slash five year degree, depending on the duration of the rest. Uh, at the beginning of the academic year, they give us an indication what they are maybe thinking about, but this is not their final decision. We're very much aware of that and communicate that obviously with our cohort. They're allowed to give us multiple answers. Um, this way we can plan the year better. We can put events for our students. We can invite them to open talks. We can bring lectures from other departments over. We can invite the students. What that also allows us is to um, run our mentoring program a little bit better. I'll talk about the mentoring program in more detail in a second, it's something we're piloting this year. Um, but very briefly, it allows us to buddy up students who wish to do so with ex foundation students who are already in year one and year two. And we quite often try to do that based on the programs they're telling us they would like to progress to. So for example, if there's a student wishing to progress to law, LLB, we would naturally try to match them with um, an ex-foundation year alum uh, who's currently doing LLB. So again, that, that 
I suppose, helps uh, and, and gives students more insights into what they're planning to do later on. Um, at the end of the year, as long as the, stu as long as the student met the progression criteria, which are the same at every level of study, it, there's nothing special between um, in terms of progressing from foundation to year one or progressing from year one to year two or from year two to year three. So as long as the student met the progression criteria, we update internally their student record and they just naturally go on to, to that degree. So there is no need um, for a separate application. There is no need for um, another UCAS application. We already, um, see, well, those students are already, you know, students on a four year degree uh, from day one, really. Um, I would say, um, this question comes up sometimes, is it possible to change uh, the degree? I mean, yes, um, this would be depending on, on when the student wants to, wants to do that. I would say as long as it's done before the first year starts, then absolutely. Uh, once the first year starts, that, that might be slightly more complicated, but of course, before it starts, yes. Um, I will also stress that we don't have any prerequisites uh, which means, um, let's say, if a student wants to do economics and law, I think this is the example I use quite a lot because a lot of foundation year students um, progress to those two programs. Um, so we don't have, uh, I don't know, a minimum grade set up apart from obviously passing the program, but we do not have, I don't know, you must get at least 70% in, in such and such exam. No such things exist. Um, do, do students need to pick a particular pathway to be able to progress to a degree? Also, no, we would strongly encourage, obviously, and our admissions team is really, really good at, at um, recommending the correct pathway or the more applicable pathway to the students. But at the end of the day, they are, uh, we allow students to progress to any degree they want from any of the pathways. And if there are any questions about this, I'll happily answer them, obviously, uh, towards the end of this um, presentation. I think this is also important, so sort of what support is available to students. They are, again, fully SOAS students, so any services, options, I don't know, uh, departments which run at SOAS are available and open to foundation year students. There are cases in which foundation year students have a, a maybe a priority as well, um, seeing as they are, uh, well, the freshmen, so year one students. Um, at the very, very beginning of the foundation year program, we assign an academic advisor to every student and they have that same academic advisor, uh, which is an academic, one of the academics from the team throughout the year one. Some of the meetings with the academic advisor are scheduled and obviously we strongly, strongly encourage students to reach out to their academic advisor. If they don't, the academic advisor will reach out to them just to make sure they're on track, just to make sure they're doing well and, and to answer any questions um, they may have. We also have a whole team of, of lecturers. So even if a lecturer is not somebody's academic advisor, students of course can reach out to them for help. Um, we have module conveners as well. So lecturers who are in charge of a particular module um, or myself um, or my boss, David Webster, so my manager or my colleague, Robin Carney. Um, of course, we're all here, always happy to help. We have a very strong administration team. Uh, so we're also based in an office on campus, uh, but we also provide online services in terms of administration. Uh, so students can arrange a, an online meeting or a face-to-face -face meeting, and they could help students with any admin related problem you can um, think of really. We have now moving a little bit more into the kind of central services. Um, we have student and well, uh, student well-being service, uh, so very, very core key service at SOAS, closely linked to the, the mental health advisors as well. Uh, they work under one department, I believe, right now, and we often refer students to them. So more detailed information about those services is available on our website. Uh, as well as the disability services, as these are the centrally provided services. I think I've um, also missed out, there is plenty uh, of different societies um, that we would encourage students to, to engage with. So I think I'll pass on to Jenny for a second before um, I go to the FAQs. So she can talk to you a little bit more about the student perspective and what are her 
experiences so far and how does the student life look like? Um, well, you'll have some first-hand experience. I'll stop sharing my screen. Off to you, Jenny. Yeah, so before I came onto the foundation year, I didn't realize that I could literally do everything that was available to me at the university. So no matter what society you want to you want to join, you can just join it. Um, there are loads of societies as academic ones. So we have like the Open Economics Forum, we have the UN Society, and then we have some more like leisure societies like the Anime Society, we have Creative Cafe, and there's music societies. So I feel like the societies that so us do cover a broad range of topics you can do if you want to enjoy or if you want to do something a bit more academic to help your studies. And then on top of that, we also have our um, student hub. That's one thing. And then we also have our union. So we have a union bar at the bottom of the junior common room. <laughs> Everyone goes there all the time. <laughs> Um, you don't have to particularly drink, but people just sit there and study as well. It's a nice chill place, it's really good vibes, honestly. Um, everyone's so welcoming. You can literally talk to anybody there and they'll be open to talking to you, listening to you. It's just, it's such a nice atmosphere. So everyone's just so lovely and welcoming. I've made friends who are mature students, which I I did not realize I could do that. I didn't know they would be willing to talk to me because I am only first year, but everyone's so lovely. Brilliant, thank you, Jenny. And I just realized that I wanted actually your um, your view, maybe your, your experience in one of the modules, but I forgot to tune you in. I was in the zone presenting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, well, like I mentioned before, Jenny's currently studying, so you haven't done term two modules yet, but. Can you share your experiences with us, maybe of some, some of the things you've done in class or how do the classes look like? Um, what's your experience? So one thing I noticed at the very beginning, um, academic practice, I, when, I saw them, when I saw the topics, I didn't understand why we had to do them, honestly. But coming to the end of it, I realized the importance of it. It seems like it's supposed to be so simple but it's really not. And especially coming onto like the essays at the end of term one, you are gonna realize that you use all of the skills that you have learned in term one of academic practice in those essays and in those portfolios. So I have really learned the importance of those skills and definitely bring them forward into the rest of my university career. So it might be a bit of a bore at first, but just know it is really important. Brilliant, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, and I don't think I'm going to go back to the presentation because all I have on there is um, some FAQs, which I can just read out maybe to, to start the, the conversation going. So please feel free to start putting your uh, questions in the, in the chat and between me and Jenny, we'll, we'll answer them. And maybe just to kick off, I picked two common questions that came up, I think, in the last open day. So one of them was, what are the typical teaching methods um, on the program? Um, so I'll start with uh, maybe the, the pandemic part. So we currently teach face-to-face. -face. So all our classes are face-to-face -face this year, well, pending any changes to government advice, apart from lectures. So lectures would be normally delivered in, in big lecture theatres. And we thought that with the current social well, distancing and just precautions in place, we've moved only lectures online. So students are able to log into them and we deliver them via Zoom. Other than that, we teach everything face-to-face. -face. Uh, Pre-pandemic, obviously, everything face-to-face, -face, but we had big lectures with, um, I would say, over 100 students in the lecture, but that would be um, two hours a week. No, one hour, two hours, yes, two hours in term one, one hour in term two of lectures. Um, and everything else was delivered in the form of a seminar, so a smaller group. Students are, are grouped into cohorts of about 23, 25 students depending on the group, and they would um, attend this in smaller group sessions. So with their lecture, they're more practical, I would say. So like Jenny was saying, you know, you, you practice your skills, you do your assignments, you work on your portfolios. Um, and traditionally, the IT class is delivered in an IT lab. Um, and the second FAQ that I have just from the last session, a session or a, a, a last similar open day, is what assessment method, what assessment methods are used on the program. Uh, so Daniel already mentioned essays, there will be a lot of that, reports, portfolio assignments, 
which, um, well, I personally prefer because students are able to build on them as they go throughout the year, as opposed to have that one all or nothing uh, assessment at the end. We also have not many, but um, some exams. So I believe we try to make sure that students take one exam a year. Um, Jenny, you'll be happy to hear, not this year, <laughs> but from, from next year, exams are back. Um, we also do presentations, students record videos for us. So we have actually quite a wide selection of, of assessments. So it's not the very traditional and standard uh, exam and coursework or you know essay and an exam at the end type of setup. I would say these were my main two questions. And I think the other most popular one is the progression one. So how does the foundation year link with, with year one and how does that work? I hope I covered it um, well enough earlier on when I was talking through one of the slides, but please, please put your questions in the chat. I can see one message in the chat. Oh, it was just to me that we can now start the presentation, <laughs> Q&A. <laughs> right, there I am. We do have one that's come up in the Q&A session. Thank you, Sarah, which is about the kind of topics that are covered in the cultural fluency um, module on the foundation year. Let me, so I know that, hmm, see, this is not my academic background. So I'm from the economics, uh, law, business management and maths background. But saying that, if you just give me three seconds, I will be able to tell you this. I am very quickly checking the, our latest syllabus. Um, we do update our modules every year to make sure that they're current, that we're using the sort of latest reading lists and, and research onto them. There I am. I'm just checking it live. If you give me one second, I'll be able to talk you through it. Right, so this year, because we had a little review over the summer, we did a whole review process where we looked at every single module and took account uh, students' feedback, feedback from other departments, and made sure that those modules are fit for purpose. So this year, there I wouldn't say there are huge changes, but we definitely polished them and made some small changes. Hence why I wanted to check that I'm definitely still uh, remember what's in them exactly, as I don't teach this particular module. So for example, in cultural fluency, students um, look at cultural um, diversity and global citizenship. They um, discuss uh, and make sure that they can demonstrate an understanding of the importance of language and communication and cultural fluency. Um, and let me go through, there I am. Cross-cultural understanding in addition to that, globalization, obviously this is a topic that will also be touched on in the world from SOAS. They don't, maybe by the titles, they, they don't look like they're linked, uh, but there is a very nice uh, natural progression between those modules. Um, and I would say a lot, a lot about cultural diversity in there. Um, in that module, I think I believe that this year we've also linked it with a, a, a SOAS, something that's very important well, throughout the world, but we definitely make sure we cover that and our students are, are familiar with this and, and comfortable discussing those topics. We've merged a, a huge part about race and belonging into the cultural influence module as well. I hope that answers it a bit. Um, is that the, oh, another one. Regarding lectures being done online currently, are there expectations to return to the lecture theaters in 22, 23? Uh, I mean, at the moment, yes, we are, we are hoping that we can return back to lectures next year. Um, they were fantastic in year one. Uh, I delivered a lot of them. It's personally, I prefer the face-to-face the -face lectures. However, I understand the benefits also for the students who can um, do it in their own time. And, and log in from wherever they are. So this year, until the end of the academic year, we will continue with the lectures online and pending government guidance. At the moment, we're doing seminars face-to-face. -face. If anything changes, we obviously have the infrastructure to move it immediately online. But yes, the plan is hopefully to come back to uh, fully face-to-face -face teaching next year. 
Um, and there's a second part of that question. Additionally, does this impact any potential guest events talks? Uh, with people coming into SOAS from other institutions that students would be able to access. We currently have all of those online. Um, so any, any extra talks, any lectures delivering anything on foundation, we do everything online. Um, so it doesn't impact it. In year one, we've done, because we moved online at the beginning of term two, so our first year of delivery, so the 2019-2020 academic year, um, was interesting to say the least. So we've done ter term one face to face and some of those guest talks, some of those events for foundation year students were done face to face. Um, and I think we moved online a little bit more in line with continental Europe as opposed to the UK guidance. So I think we moved online probably three weeks before uh, it was made a little bit more common in the UK. So our term two events uh, were online. They both work well. They both have, uh, I would say, drawbacks as well as advantages. So uh, tricky to say. I think most students prefer the online lectures. I prefer the face-to-face -face lectures. Mm -hmm. um, how does that, on to another question, uh, how does the foundation course blend with combined linguistics uh, and Japanese? Right, so because you're mentioning, Albert, uh, um, a language, degree so we do not offer language on foundation specifically so unfortunately languages are, are not one of the available options um i'm sure you've seen from the little table i showed we don't have a language there um what we do is talks with the departments uh, but i understand that doesn't quite substitute a, a language class so what students can do is they can sign up to additional language courses if they wish to but this is in addition to the foundation year, not part of a foundation year. Um, and in terms of progression, um, that's absolutely fine, the same as with any other degree, i.e. if the degree is available at SOAS, running in the current year, foundation year students can progress to it um, without any issues. We actually got some very interesting data just a few weeks ago, so we're still analyzing it on how the foundation year students, so the last two cohorts, the first two cohorts who progressed from foundation to year one, how are they performing? How are they doing in comparison to students who entered directly into year one without doing the foundation element? Um, and I remember uh, that they're all doing um, well, equally well, if not better in some cases, but I remember the linguistics and Japanese one because we had um, some worries a little, to be honest about this, because we don't offer um Japanese as part of the foundation saying that very few students come with prior you know knowledge of those languages so they were doing absolutely fine and that's a very long way to say yes you can progress to that degree we also have a question that's come through the chat um, as opposed to the Q&A, mm -hmm. which is just a student looking for some reassurance. Is the foundation year for every subject or just for specific subjects? And I know you've touched on that throughout mm -hmm. your talk, but I didn't know if you wanted to just come back Absolutely. to that. So it's, it's not for a specific subject. It's, um, I would say it's quite a generic foundation, or not a generic, quite an overview. It gives you a good introduction on how to be um, a, a strong student with all the kind of important graduate attributes. So there will be an element of history in the course, obviously, but with um, the type of institution so as I can't imagine us doing it any other way. Um, and I think that will give you a very, very strong start and grounding um, and prepare you for the degrees you can progress to, but it is not a history specific or any module specific really um, foundation. So I would say the, more, the two key elements of it, well, first of all, definitely, definitely skills. So it's making sure that we bridge any potential gaps between the, the qualifications and the educational experiences that our students had coming in and what is expected the, of them and, and what do they need to know and be able to do in order to thrive in their undergraduate degree. That, that's one part of it. And the other part of it is uh, we will definitely be discussing and engaging with um, topics and areas um, and academic fields that are very, very core to everything we do at SWAS, history being one of them. 
Yeah, could I just jump on to yeah, one of the free. language questions Thanks. from Albert? Um, so I am actually doing one of the language courses that SOAS offers. It's a paid one, but you get a discount because you're a SOAS student. And I'm doing it in Chinese. And you can, you develop as you go. So you start from like a beginner's course, depending on how confident you are with the language. And you go on and you go on and you go on and you develop term by term. So it's a term by term course. And um, because I don't want to do a language as part of my actual degree, but I would still love to learn a language. So I think that's one opportunity that you can really take advantage of as SOAS. I mean, Jenny, thank you for highlighting that. Absolutely. So um, we have so many students interested in, in Chinese or I think Korean is, the, is our latest <laughs> hottest language, uh, uh, Japanese, but there's obviously plenty um, on offer. So some of our students do exactly what, what Jenny does. So if that's in addition to the degree, which I think is just fantastic and the opportunities is there, why not? Um, so I would strongly recommend this to, to everyone. And I have, I've now opened both chat and the Q&A and I can see, thanks Albert, and I can see another question. The foundation year doesn't specifically mean you have to know what subject you would like to study in. If you mean what you would like to progress to, that's correct. So um, you start foundation and we do ask you, but this is just a gentle, gentle, more resource planning and make sure that myself and the team can kind of tailor the experience for you, um, but you don't need to know. So I have a number of students when, I, when we asked in October, I think, what degree they would like to progress to, they're not sure. And that's absolutely fine. That's the, that's the whole point of the foundation program that we, we want to show you what's on offer. We want you to be sure by the end of it. Um, some students are sure at the beginning, equally great. <laughs> um, but no, you do not have to. So in terms of the kind of the technicalities of this, are that on our systems, in terms of, I don't know, student finance, which a lot of students use, I believe it's called a four-year degree in social sciences or, or something like that on, on somewhere deep down in the system. Um, and then during the foundation course or towards the end of it, we internally change it to, to whatever it is that you wish to progress to. Actually, Jenny, I'm sorry, I'm gonna put you on the spot. We had a little chat before, but what Jenny's thinking of progressing to, it's a very difficult choice. <laughs> I don't envy you, they're both fantastic. Um, I'm not gonna you know, say it out loud maybe uh, and, and, and give it out just yet, but Jenny has until what? Um, probably May to make up her mind or April. And then if anything happens and, and you change your mind, you can then come to me and let me know and, and we'll, will update that so that's as simple as that um, and those little conversations for example like I had at 10 to 10 today with Jenny will allow me I already have a little note to make sure to put her in touch with somebody or send her a link or make sure she attends a specific talk just to help her make that choice yeah I feel like speaking to your subject teachers at the end of your classes is really helpful I've gotten a lot of advice I usually stay behind for five ten minutes just to have a chat and this really helped me over the time. It's really helped narrow down choices for me, clear things up. So don't feel shy, just go for it. They're, everyone's lovely, so yeah. And we have a question about the entry criteria. Um, so I believe that at the moment it's a, a triple C and we also uh, do review contextualized, um, well, we have contextualized admissions, so contextualized offers. We review every application. So they like traditionally they go through um, our admissions team. Laura, you can correct me on this here. Um, and I'm one of the admissions tutors. So I know that if there are any borderline applications, even for students who maybe haven't necessarily met this or have um, um, wonderful combination of different um, both qualifications and experiences and a statement uh, and ex I don't know, life experiences. All those applications are reviewed by myself and my colleague. Um, so it's not just grades. Uh, we know that there is so much more to, to everybody than just that one A-level exam that you, you may have a, you know, a worse day off. But officially, I believe it's triple C and then sometimes that, that varies in, in clearing. And just to 
say if you are looking for the IB equivalent or you're studying a particular international qualification, then the best place to go is our website. And if you go onto the Foundation Year page, you can see what ideally our admissions tutors would be looking for. But we do take everything into account, um, like it's already been said. So the website is the best place and get in touch if you've got any questions. And I can't stress this enough, we definitely do take everything into account. I, I, I'm one of the people who reviews those applications and, uh, well, it's pages and pages and pages of it. And I can assure you that it's not just the grades. We really look at every aspect of the application, at the personal statement, at the reference, uh, at the subjects the students did. Um, so it, it, it is you know, a, a really thought through decision, not just checking grades against the triple C. Um, I have another question. Will there be a talk about undergraduate degrees and talk about subjects? I'm so sorry, okay, but do you mean right now or at some point in foundation year? Because right now I'm going to say no. <laughs> I said not from me. I don't think I'm able to cover all the degrees available at SARS. I know the open day is running today. Um, so I think you're in the foundation year. Okay, thank you. I thought you wanted me to give you a quick overview of, I don't know, 700 options. <laughs> um, in the foundation year. Yes, so what we do in the foundation year, well, A, we invite our students to events like this as well. So even this open day that's also open to, to you know, people and potential students who are not part of Celestia, our students can come to that. So that's one thing. Uh, second of all, we uh, create special events purely for foundation students, so no external guests are invited to those. Um, I don't think we do them for every single degree because there's just so many combinations, but we definitely do them for all the most popular ones. An example being, I think we just held the event for economics in December. Uh, so the economics team came over and, and just did a presentation purely for foundation year students, already understanding their program, already understanding the process, already knowing what modules our students do. So this is not as generic. This is quite a tailored conversations that they're having with the students. Um, so we do that. Uh, in addition to that, we also bring lectures in. So sometimes if there is, um, I don't know, a particular pathway, particular degree option where we might not do a two hour talk with, uh, with the pizza, uh, we bring them into our lectures. So I think there's a lot of that going on on the social sciences pathway, especially in terms two, uh, in term two, and on the BMO pathway, well, we'll have that in the economics and law part um, as well. We also have, this is a pilot, so I don't want to brag too much about it, but it's, you know, it, it sounds fantastic already. We also have a mentoring program for students starting this term, so I think it's starting next week. Um, and what we're trying to do is, we, we are currently recruiting foundation alum, as we call them. So um, students who completed foundation in the last three years and right now are, are loving life in year one or year two of their undergraduate degrees. And we will be matching them with current foundation year students who expressed interest in this uh, program and in this kind of initiative, and they will be just budding up with each other. So we will try to match them based on the degree that the current student wants to do and the FY alum is currently doing. So that will also give them, um, I would say, a more insight and, and uh, a peer-to-peer -peer interaction of how it's going and what they can expect. I hope that answers it. Have we got any other questions? We have a question from Sarah, I think it is, in the awesome. Q&A, which is about the pros and cons of London, especially as an international student. Jenny, can I pass this one over to you? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually from London. I grew up in London. Um, pros and cons of London. So the pros, you're going to meet so many different types of people. You're going to meet people from countries you've never heard of um learn about their cultures um it's just it's really lovely that that's one thing um there's, there's so many pros of london i love london i wanted to stay in london for a reason um transport's great you have tfl you have the tubes you have buses buses run till late 
that's another thing also like the um, actual city of London is beautiful you're not far from the Thames at Soas as well so just go take a walk you're not far from Oxford Street all the shops it's yeah that's definitely one thing and then a con of London the weather <laughs> <laughs> like right now it's so gray and gloomy outside Mine is okay <laughs> it's okay yeah this is natural light coming in <laughs> <laughs> um only thing is the weather but you learn to get through it yeah that's about it yeah I agree and I think that everything especially if we're taking this in the context of SOAS we're so centrally based yeah. there's so many fantastic things around so uh, well A we're surrounded by universities so even though we're not a traditional campus university as you can I don't know see in American films <laughs> there's so many universities around you really get that buzz you really get that feel I mean um, you will see people sitting on benches reading their books and, and kind of preparing for their next class and discussing something. And so I specifically go right next to British Museum, which um, I mean, perfect. Uh, and we quite a few times took our classes there and actually delivered lectures while wandering through the halls. Um, just, you know, there's so few places in the world where you can do that where you can actually discuss a history or, or heritage of, of a nation of some country while standing in front of it. Um, there is a whole debate. Uh, I probably shouldn't be starting it here. Should it be there? Uh, and that's uh, also in our classes. But I think you can discuss it while you're there and you understand it a bit more. So um, the opportunities are fantastic. I mean, I'm not from London. I live in London. Sarah, I would recommend it. It's the place to be. <laughs> Uh, and coming to Albert, uh, can you discuss the application process and timeline? Laura, can I? Do you know this one? I'm really sorry that I don't do. I don't work in admissions, so I review the. No, I don't. That's no problem. I can speak a little bit to it, and then if you have any questions afterwards, you're very welcome to get in touch, Albert. But generally speaking, we our foundation year applications come through UCAS, so you apply just like any other degree, and you can find the UCAS code on the program page. Once you've completed your UCAS application, which you might do through your school or you can do independently, then generally speaking, it will take admissions anywhere from about four to six weeks um, to review your application and to respond. And that's because, like it's been said many times, we take every element of your application into account. We review it thoroughly. We look at the entire profile. What motivations are you highlighting in your personal statement? What's your academic background? And do we think that the foundation year is the right choice for you? And so because it happens through UCAS, it generally follows the standard UCAS timeline of you responding to your offer, making decisions based on the universities and the different programmes that you've applied to. So that can also be a great resource. But if you have applied or you're thinking about applying in this cycle, then once you've submitted that application, about four to six weeks um, is the standard. And if you're having any trouble, like I said, you're very, very welcome um, to get in touch. And we'll be accepting applications for September for a number of months. So you've got time to apply um, if you like the sound of the foundation year. I think what I'll do as well, I'm, I'm on the chat. I'm gonna put my email address as well in the chat. Um, and I quite often meet uh, usually online of, our you know students who are considering joining foundation or if you have any questions that come to your mind after today's chat feel free to email me um and and we can either arrange a call or i'll happily answer by email so i'm going to put my email in the chat you can find me on the website as well uh, but you've got it just I, it, I hope it i think it went to everybody We've just had one more question and then we'll probably have to wrap up the session that sneaked in um, before your message in the chat, but it's about, is it common to come directly from school into the foundation year or even with a degree itself without a gap? I mean, yes, I think absolutely. So we have a proportion of students who, who took a gap year, um, especially now with the pandemic situation, you know, that, that um, maybe not for everybody, but for a number of students that that was part of the decision making um, process, I believe. Uh, but a lot of our students, I would say definitely more than half, come without a gap. Uh, so they come directly after their um, 
you know, previous educational experiences. So, so we have a good mix of both, uh, probably a little bit, I'm not gonna say more, but more than usual students coming with a gap now because of the pandemic. Uh, but I think that was predominantly last year and we're back to our traditional kind of setup and, and, and ratios as, uh, as it was in 2019, so pre-pandemic. Jenny, do you have any, a lot of students in your class? I know, um, yeah, it's kind of like yeah. half, half. So yeah. we do have half of them did have a gap year and then half did just come through from school. Mm -hmm. So it's about 50, 50. Yeah, that, that's my experience as well. Adi, I hope that helps. All right, I think we might have to um, start wrapping um, up the session but we do have lots more happening in in the open day so make sure to check your program you can come along and hear some more subject panels or if you want to hear from more SOAS students then um, there'll be a live chat starting at 11. Brilliant well thank you all so much uh, and thank you Lauren thank you Jen so much for all your help today this is fantastic uh everybody thanks for joining you've got my email address so like I said feel free to to reach out to me and we can schedule a call or I can answer any questions you may have uh, well, any way you wish. Brilliant, thank you.